Okay, great. Thank you for coming, um, um, everyone. Thank you, everyone, especially uh, Mr. Gilatwala, who's in, and it's still off for Eid. So, special shout out to you for being here. Thank no, you. So Thank you for having Thank me. You. We're actually uh, back in the office. Uh, the last day of the holidays was yesterday. Oh, Oh. But I, I, even if it wasn't, it's, it's not like anything else was happening. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> right, great. Should we do little introductions for everyone? Uh, we have Mr. Balaji here, uh, Strategy Officer. I'm, I'm looking at my screen because I don't want to get this wrong. Uh, TVO Holidays, a member of WTTC and has won um, multiple awards as a leading B2B travel provider. And we have Mr. Radnan Gilitwala, Director Dadabai Travel, which opens its first agency in 1981 in downtown Bahrain. And now is <laughs> all over the Middle East with branches in Saudi Arabia and UAE. Lost with that now. Yeah. I wasn't there in 1981, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, just to let you know that's what happened. <laughs> Um, Ms. Maggie Boothman, uh, she is the uh, general manager of UAE for uh, Travel Counselors, which was established in Manchester in 19, and now is a global travel company with a presence in seven countries, including the UAE, of course. Uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar, Managing Director, Cruise Master, a cruise booking agency in the Middle East with a B2B model that helps travel agents sell cruises. Uh, Ms. Emily uh, Williams, uh, B2C head of retail and product, Dinata Travel, uh, the biggest travel provider in the Middle East for um, leisure and retail in the Middle East market. So yeah, there, great. So, uh, and of course, this Kim Thompson, director of uh, publishing director <laughs> by weekday and marathon, half marathon runner by weekend. <laughs> Show off. But I'm too old to go to the malls in the UAE. Um, well, that's me, Rashi, and you guessed it, not a half marathon runner by the weekend. So, okay. Um, with our first question, what and how was your organization doing before being hit by COVID-19? Um, please, let's uh, begin with Mr. Balaji, the same sequence that I called out. So, Mr. Balaji first. Uh, what and how was your organization doing? Let's keep it brief. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, all of you. Um, thanks, Rashi, for this opportunity. We were uh, really doing well to January 2020. We were growing at a global pace of 60% plus over the previous year. And we are uh, doing a lot of new markets and things were uh, picking up well. And we, uh, the East Europe market picked up, then UK, Latin America, America in general, overall picked up. Then we had the API business was picking up. And TBO Air was also picking up well being a new product for the last one year. And of course, we, the, uh, we were the for third OTA uh, from the Hajumra Ministry, uh, recognized with the Hajumra Ministry as Zamzam.com. We were about to launch that as a third OTA. And uh, we were preparing all well for the future. And of course, this happened. And we think. Uh, uh, there is nothing um, like this is a very short term uh, that the pain that we're going to have and uh, we definitely have a long term gain if we prepare well and skillfully, uh, you know, uh, pass this uh, and uh, we are confident and uh, we should all have a strong big, uh, conviction with my, of course, uh, I've been in the industry for 35, 40 years now, I've passed so many uh, things before and after every situation uh, but it is travel has really come up well, and uh, it is uh, it is actually become a culture of the world. The travel has become a culture, so uh, we are absolutely okay. And I think maybe the time will pass, and we will be right, and uh, we should be doing well. Let us prepare ourselves for that. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Again, Mr. Gilitwala, go next, please. Yeah, we actually had a very good uh, 2019. Our numbers were growing, they have been growing for the past few years. We did also open uh, our latest branch in Kuwait and we were seeing some very good growth over there. I think that's a very good market to be in. We had a lot of plans to expand further and we started taking our first steps to enter the digital space by developing our own in-house uh, booking engine for both B2B and B2C. And 
incorporate some uh, other ancillary products like a loyalty engine and uh, a few other uh, e-commerce uh, products to supplement that. Um, again, making very good progress until this unfortunate situation happened, which has set us back a few months. But like uh, Mr. Ashok very rightly mentioned, our focus is the future. And we are building all of this new infrastructure for uh, times that are beyond this. And we're really looking forward to seeing just how much the industry grows because this is one of the unique industries that does grow every single year as more and more people uh, start traveling and start traveling more frequently as well. And it's never been easier to travel and we just want to be able to capitalize on the opportunities that are presented to us. Great. Maggie, do you want to follow up with how uh, travel counselors were doing in, you know, in the UAE? Uh, well, I've been with travel councillors for four years, even though we've been established here for eight years. Um, at the end of January, which was the first quarter, because we are aligned with the UK financial year, we were um, on track for a 22% increase over FY19 with 70 TCs in the business and over 50 million dirham in sales. So um, we were on an amazing um, curve upwards, which ceased quite quickly in February. Um, can we follow up with uh, Ashok, please? How, how and what were you doing before disaster hit? Uh, traditionally, uh, January, February is uh, our peak uh, booking period, uh, what they call it in the West as the wave season, where majority of the booking come around that period. And uh, end of January, we were roughly bit between 24 or 25% up versus last year and we're looking forward to the season. And unfortunately, the COVID-19 came and uh, it's upset uh, plans for uh, everybody in the industry. Yes, didn't it? Mm -hmm. um, Emily, can we go next, please? Hi, everyone. So um, I look after Donata Travel um, B2C. So here in the UAE, I look after our retail and leisure business. Um, so pre-COVID, yeah, we'd had an excellent um, 2019. Also, we had um, opened three new retail outlets um, in 2019. So in uh, Murdoff, uh, The Palm and out in Motor City, which we're all doing really well, which we were obviously really excited about. Um, we, you know, our business has about um, 30 plus retail outlets, a website and um, a call centre. So, you know, we were really spending a lot of time um, looking into projects that were helping us to really grow um, that omni-channel uh, business and really be able to relate to our customers and um, help them to book whichever way they wanted to book. So we had done a lot of, um, I guess, technology upgrades and rollouts to be able to really help um, with that customer journey to be a lot more personalised um, moving into the future. So I think for us at the moment, um, this uh, COVID situation has just given, I guess, a bit of an opportunity to pause um, and to relook at what that strategy was and, and if, you know, if it was the right way for us to continue on into the future. Um, you know, I think we've all been talking a lot about when things go back to normal and I just, I don't think that normal will ever exist in the way that it was prior to this. I think we're going to have <laughs> a new normal um, and I think it's going to, you know, really impact how people uh, want to travel and, um, and I guess what, what they, um, you know, how they're going to go about doing that. But I think... Um, you know, for us, at the end of the day, um, our vision is just about being the world's most admired travel services provider. So that's very, very much what we're focusing on at the moment is how we can ensure um, to keep providing that for our customers. Great. So um, the next part of the question is, uh, I'm going to meet you there, Emily. Uh, so the next part of the question is, which destinations were sh selling the most uh, for you uh, across your different channels? Eh? Can we start with uh, Balaji, please? Yeah, uh, before the, in 2019 till January, uh, as far as uh, online B2A focus globally, uh, we were uh, like Dubai was number one, followed by London, Singapore, Istanbul, Paris, Bangkok, Mecca, New York, Cairo, and Kuala Lumpur. And um, as far as packages were concerned, it was basically countries like UAE, Thailand, Malaysia. Singapore, Indonesia, Turkey, France, Maldives, and Azerbaijan, and finally Hong Kong. These are the destinations, yeah. Okay, great. That uh, is where we were doing well. 
Yes, it sounds like it. There's a lot of destinations you covered there. Mr. Gilakwala, give us the news from Bahrain, please. Uh, our, biggest, uh, our biggest destinations, primarily from Bahrain, but also across our offices within the region, were um, London and Western Europe, uh, Istanbul, Bangkok, and uh, a few other places in Southeast Asia, and uh, Dubai, mainly as a connecting hub to the other destinations worldwide. And uh, we have seen a lot of demand for Eastern Europe since um, the visa restrictions are very lax over there. And as a destination, it is very appealing to people from our parts of the world because uh, a lot of the amenities and a lot of the features essentially that travelers from our market look for are present over there. And it's still relatively natural, untapped, and it's a good experience for them. Great, thank you. Uh, Maggie, you're up next. Um, the UAE is a key uh, driver for us. Um, a lot of our sales do relate to the staycation market. Um, Indian Ocean would be the second region that is um, a key destination for the expat community. So we have obviously Mauritius, Maldives, Sri Lanka, um, Africa, and also um, the Seychelles. The USA and Canada had um, done very, very well for us. We had some really good solid uh, inquiries for that region and London and Europe, um, specifically Switzerland as well as Germany um, and the UK in general are also key destinations for the travel councillors at the moment. But, you know, we sort of treat the world as our oyster because we tailor make all of our um, itineraries for our customers based on their needs. Um, you know, it's very, very much on the whim and the, the ability uh, by the customer to be um, adventurous. So we follow their adventurous traits. Sure. It's very interesting what you said, because um, if domestic travel is the way out, you're the luckiest of the lot, because UAE has always been the most important uh, feeder market, for, I mean, destination for you. So great. Yeah, yes. and we've already um, come back with our staycation market. We did a lot of research for the staycation market to make sure that we did have the um, the right checks and balances in place for offering staycations to our customers because we wanted to make sure, obviously, first and foremost, their safety was um, key and that the suppliers that we were dealing with and the properties we were dealing with had the appropriate checks and measures in place to ensure that safety. Of course. Of course. Um, Ashok, could you tell us what was happening in the world of cruising before nothing was happening? On the cruising, as they say, um, one third of the earth is uh, water and two third, sorry, one third is land and two third of the water. And we have cruises all over the globe. Uh, but majority of the travelers, they are traveling during the summer months of June, July and August. And we have uh, the majority of the business was traveling in the, the northern Europe, going to the Baltic areas, uh, the Alaskas, uh, the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. Uh, which at this stage, uh, it's uh, everybody is, is a big question mark. But these are four key area where most of these uh, business during the summer was booked to travel. In that order that you just mentioned, uh, I would say in terms of percentage, yes, the North Europe or the Baltic will be the highest one, and the second will be the Alaska, and the third one will be the Mediterranean one. Okay, that's very interesting. Then interesting. other than. Unfortunately, uh, the weather-wise, it becomes a little bit warmer, so people do prefer to go out uh, in, in the cooler areas. Oh, great. Emily, what were the top destinations for Donata travel? Sure. Um, so for us, um, similar to Mel Maggie, is the UAE has always been our number one in terms of uh, room nights. Destination Dubai is, is obviously very important to us and, um, you know, to the group in terms of, you know, being the hub for the airline. But um, we've got so many awesome properties here that that um, is a big one. And we also have been seeing some really strong numbers coming through in the last few weeks for customers wanting to get away on a staycation for the Eid break and also um, for future. Um, we have the 
excuse me, um, our usual top performers are very similar to what everybody else was saying with, you know, Thailand, um, Turkey, the UK, but particular destinations um, that I found were um, growing a lot this year were um, the Indian Ocean for us is a, is a big one, so Maldives, Mauritius, the Seychelles. Um, but some interesting ones that we hadn't really seen much of in the past was uh, Russia. Had, we had a really um, huge growth last summer um, and some more of the of Eastern Europe. Um, Ireland and Portugal were two more, um, especially uh, obviously Emirates started the direct um, additional flight into Porto last year. Um, and then the other one um, which has been hugely popular was Japan. So we've seen, a, we had a lot of demand for Japan and um, we have a, another a team with us, Dinata Sports Travel. Um, and they, we've been doing, um, we were doing the Olympics, so selling Olympics tickets and Olympics packages, which obviously has been postponed until next year, but we're still seeing um, a lot of demand and people inquiring for that now, which is really great. So people planning for the future for 2021. Mm, great, thank you, Emily. Uh, so we move on to the next uh, part of the conversation, which is the present. And obviously the present is rife with uh, what I assume uh, mass cancellations. Um, uh, clearly the industry was not prepared for um, cancellations of this scale. What are your thoughts on this, uh, Mr. Balaji? Um, how, has, how has everyone been reacting? How has the industry reacted? How is your specific organization reacting to these cancellations? See this guy. Cancellation is something which is bound to happen at this uh, thing, so we need to accept the reality and it's really a massive cancellation and it's negative sales, of course, uh, for the past two months, it's only negative sales. And um, we have set up a separate COVID uh, refund uh, division and uh, we immediately deployed people to handle the cancellations and uh, it is working 24 by 7. And uh, so far, we could manage 85% of the refunds, uh, you know, uh, to the customers, except 15% that we're still under follow-up. Of course, this 15% also is that we are closely following up. And this is based on, this 15% is based on a, a, a situation where the city was open and the airline was uh, operating at that time. And... Uh, uh, passengers where there is no lockdown at the situation. So it is a question of hotel chains and the airlines and you know the uh, properties, uh, their individual decision and uh, some suppliers also is closely following up. Nevertheless, like we, we need to accept it like yes, uh, uh, that 15% is maybe we are trying to cut down that to 50% and maybe uh, leave that uh, maybe non-refundable portion, which is to critical, maybe to five to seven percent may come uh, to that level. But more or less, we are able to handle it uh, very nicely. And the whole the sales team and the operation team is closely in contact with our agents, partners around the gl globe with the commercial directors. And our team has been working tirelessly. And I appreciate uh, the suppliers and the hotels and the chains and everybody uh, who has supported in this mission. And uh, it is really valued. And we hope to do it better and there is nothing that uh, we are happy about it. We still need to go to that level of making everyone smiling. That is what we are looking at. Oh, that's great. So you are at least 85% happy with what has happened. That's, that's good. Um, um, Mr. Gilit Adnan, can I ask you the same question? How have you been dealing with the mountain cancellations? Do you want to say anything about the global situation? Were we prepared for this? Obviously not. But would we? How how can we prepare for the future? Should I don't know. Well, you rightly said no one was prepared for this. So obviously, no one was expecting this to happen. No one was expecting uh, this sort of situation. I I've only been working. I've only been back and working for a few years right now. And in those few years, I've seen a lot, but I never expected to see anything like this. I don't think anybody has. Uh, as Jedi Travel, thankfully, we've refunded. 100% of our cancellation requests, regardless of what suppliers, airlines, or anybody has said, um, customers don't want to be in a situation where they're worried about their health enough already. They're worried about stepping out of their houses. They're worried about their businesses. They're worried about their families. We don't want to give them something else to worry about as well. So whatever cancellation request has come in, we've refunded fully and then we've taken it up with the airlines or suppliers ourselves to sort it out however we've wanted to. In terms of 
the future, though, it's it's hard to say. Um, I don't think anybody has an accurate mm -hmm. sort of prediction on what can happen in the future, but we know that things are going to go on because they have to, and whoever makes the most out of the situation will, and they'll make sure that they get back on their feet and do what they have to do. Great. So you just said that, you know, 100% of it has been refunded. Do you have a figure in mind of, you know, the amount of cancellations you've had, had to return, um, not knowing whether the airlines or hotels are going to return that to you? Do you have a figure in mind that you've spent at the moment? Um, in terms of revenue amounts, no, because it's still going on right now. Uh, cancellations are still happening um, for people who have trips booked in the summer that they booked in March and April and even in this month. Uh, it's, it's very, very common for people to come through, book something just in case and then come back a week later and say they want to cancel it. That, that happens quite mm -hmm. often. Recently, Istanbul has actually opened up for tourism. They sent a circular out. I believe everybody's received it saying that they'll be opening for tourism by next month. Um, so people have come in and booked but then almost sometimes very shortly after they would come in and cancel. And um, so it, it would be difficult for me to give you an accurate figure, both in terms of tickets, bookings and revenues for that. No, but that's a good insight. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Maggie, could you answer the question? Yeah, Monday? sure. Uh, first and foremost, the most important thing was um, the repatriation of our clients and returning them to their home countries safe and sound. So we've got a 24-7 duty office that, and it, we set up a triage team to handle that. Um, you know, so again, the safety and security was paramount and returning people to their families. Um, I guess we use this analogy a bit like a car. A car drives bit much, much better forwards than it does in reverse. So a lot of our systems and operations were just not designed to cope with the sheer volume. But um, we've got some amazing teams in place in the UK where our accounts are held. And we have adopted the same uh, policy of refunding where the client has requested a refund. Um, when we have the supplier funds um, and we're honouring that. The sheer volume of the refunds sits at around about 200 at the moment um, because um, we're still... What? Sorry, what's the unit? Sorry, 200 refunds um, mm. just for our region, but obviously with um, 1,900 travel councils globally, it's about 10,000 at the moment. We've used the time very positively as well. We're doing lots of training, lots of webinars with our suppliers, and we've also done some really great work with some of our meat meet the people series so we had Cherie Blair who runs a foundation for women um, on one of our meet the CEOs and that's available to all of our TCs worldwide so we've done a you know had some really great outcomes to make sure that our uh, travel counsellors are ready and raring to go when the world opens up. That's great yeah we'll more of that in a bit. Um, Ashok you're up next um, we've heard a lot about how the cruises are dealing with cancellations and could you tell us a bit more about that yes the the situation had uh, been uh, very very exceptional i must say uh, all the resources which were uh, busy in making uh, booking for our travel partners uh, we had to deploy all those resources uh, getting the refunds from the cruise lines now some of the cruise lines have been kind enough to give them 100 uh, percent cancellation and some have gone beyond giving 125 and uh, at least one cruise line was giving up to 150 percent of the money which client had paid to retain the customer but can then all those have been like taking brands? come again can you name these brands please uh princess cruises which uh, canceled they were, they were the first one to cancel the cruises cruises uh taking as, as a pass and they had given up to on some of the sailings 150 percent of the value paid to the cruise line, which now uh, most of the cruise lines are giving uh, 125 if you are keeping your uh, funds with them. And if you want to have the cash refund, they are giving straight away 100% uh, refund. But then those process is uh, going to take uh, time. It, in some of the cases, it's taking up to uh, four months to get the money back from the cruise line. Great. But you are sure that you are going to get your money back either in the form of cash or if not, they are giving the future cruise credit, which are up to 125% value of the money that you have paid to the cruise line. 
Great, thank you. Um, can we take this question to Emily, please? Uh, you have to, yeah, thank you, Emily. Sorry, I wasn't aware that I was muted. Uh, no problem. Uh, so can we go to the question of the mounting cancellations? How is Denata reacting to them? Um, the numbers must be staggering because the business is staggering. Large. Yes. So obviously I can only speak to the piece of the business that I look after, which is our, our you know, leisure business. And we have, we've had thousands of bookings per month that we've been needing to deal with. Um, obviously we've, uh, we, all of our teams um, in the retail outlets and in our call centres, both our, um, have been going through and having to deal with each of these one by one. So we tried to make sure we could get ahead of the game and deal with both inbound calls as well as going through and contacting all of our customers um, as and when their departure date was upcoming to see what they wanted to do. Um, and in a lot of situations, customers were, um, some customers were fine to postpone trips till next year. Um, a lot of them wanted to, you know, maintain that and, and carry on and then the rest of them were refunds. So um, I think it's always difficult in situations like this because everybody has a different story and every customer has, um, you know, different needs that, that, that we're trying to meet. So um, I guess it was very interesting for us when we had to um, obviously close the stores down um, and shift as many people as possible as we could to work from home. Um, that there was a huge amount of work in that as well to be able to set up um, our consultants to be able, and our call centres to be able to operate uh, in a working from home model when they have you know, never needed to do that in the past. So um, we managed to do that uh, fairly quickly and I guess up until this point we have managed to, um, to deal with most uh, situations as and when. Um, I think, you know, uh, I, I think everybody's probably trying to do the best they can in a situation that got um, you know, flung on us all without realising. Um, I mean, I think the industry has dealt with situations on a far smaller scale like this in the past, where there's been, you know, natural disasters or volcanoes or things like that. Um, I mean, even with last year, I know some of our um, businesses in the UK, uh, when with the Thomas Cook situation, had to do quite large mass cancellations for future bookings as well. Um, I just hope that maybe some of the learnings we've gotten from this is that um, trying to figure out a better way to automate it. I think um, possibly some of the airlines may have even been looking at this in terms of how they can do better automation to be able to do the cancellations and refunds because, um, you know, it's not always an easy thing to uh, get a team and upskill them quickly enough to be able to, um, you know, be able to, to, to process such large um, amounts of payments, you know, at the same time. So, Two sub-questions. One, do you sure. have a or any numbers that we can you know put to perspective put in perspective how many cancellations or a figure to it and um, secondly from what I hear the problem of mass cancellations so, so the more customers have cancelled the bigger problem you have for boutique agencies who probably have less cancellations is it easier for them that's the question I'm asking you Emily I think that for us it's it's not even just whether or not our systems can deal with the mass cancellation but it's to do with the flow and effect from you know if you have a booking where you've booked with you know one airline and multiple hotels and then different you know companies for transfers and transport etc um, then obviously the, all of that needs to happen as well and there's obviously a flow on effect on on um, how uh, all of those you know payments and refunds need to happen across the business too so I think um, again, just trying to make sure that you've got enough people to be able to, able to be even able to process all of that is, is huge. So, um, you know, all of our systems are centralised between us and our corporate business and our um, DMC business. So it's not um, not like it's just a small team that we're running, if you know what I mean. There's, there's a lot of, of pieces to play at that. So um, I'd have to, go, I'd have to go and have a look at for a percentage for you. I don't have that on me right now. Sorry. No worries. No problem. Um, so this actually um, sets the stage for the next question quite dramatically. Should uh, travel insurance be um, compulsory in the region for travelers? I mean, it's, um, it's not compulsory at the moment. So I'll let you answer this question, Mr. Balaji, please. See, it's very much a necessity than before. You need to, you don't know what is in, uh, uh, coming in next to you. So it's better that we will be well prepared and uh, it is not only the travel insurance that we need to look at. We look at uh, uh, specific areas of cancellations, refunds, health, 
and so many aspects that we need to consider. And it also depends upon the destinations that the passengers are traveling. And uh, you know, the situation, the, the, the traveler's pattern is going to differ and it based on the countries and uh, the health and hygiene and how good they're going to open the markets and uh, how they open the tourist attractions and so many things. So even the airline, uh, right from traveling, uh, uh, everything has to be taken care. So um, it is more of a necessity and it should come as a all-inclusive price, something that should be done. That is the way I think it should work so that everybody is taken care, not only the travel agencies and the bookers or the, the, the destinations and even the customers, everybody is equally taken care. And uh, even I think uh, many insurance companies are uh, also adding up uh, these uh, uh, new things onto the travel insurance. I think they'll be adding some add-ons and but different levels. And definitely it is a very much required now and in the future. So you, you say that it should be made compulsory. That yes, yes, yes. It, 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 it saves the pain of everybody else. Otherwise, it's too much of a, you know, frustration for everybody. If you yes. have something, why don't we make use of it and better be uh, uh, happy. At least I have something with, uh, with me yes. so I can take care of myself. Great. Let me take this to Mr. Gilitwala now. Um, Adnan, can you tell us, uh, could this disaster or a percentage of this disaster be avoided if uh, travel insurance was mandatory here? Does travel, agents, uh, travel insurance cover this kind of disaster? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about travel insurance in this perspective, please? I think uh, from what I understand about travel insurance is that it only comes into effect once the traveler has actually boarded their flight and begun their trip. So I think that's the generally marketed and generally sold type of travel insurance. I, I haven't heard about too many policies that cover a, a cancellation uh, due to unforeseen circumstances before the trip comes into effect. And I don't think customers in general um, would understand or the need for that because before this, they would have had the assumption that the the trip wouldn't necessarily be cancelled, just rescheduled. You know, you know what I mean. And if it was cancelled, they would already get some form of a refund from the airline, um, pro provided uh, based on the nature of the ticket, whether it was a fully flexible ticket or a semi flexible ticket, whatever the nature of that was. As for making it mandatory, I don't think anybody likes to be forced to do anything, especially when it involves an additional cost that might not yield any benefit. Because again, before all of this happened, not too many, I, I, I can say that the percentage of flights globally that were being canceled on a regular basis were quite small. The majority of flights were taking off as scheduled, landing as scheduled, and trips were progressing the way that they were intended to. This might change the perception of people globally. They might see the need for it, but if you can justify the intrinsic and tangible value of travel insurance to customers, then I think it makes sense to make it mandatory. But just telling them flat out that, no, now you will have to have travel insurance, no matter what, if you want to fly, I don't think people are going to respond too heavily, too, too uh, positively to that. Wow, great. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, Maggie, would you like to tell us more about what you feel about travel insurance for travelers? Well, as an Australian um, and working in the industry for a long time, we have for a number of years, and I think Emily would agree, mandated that travel insurance is just absolutely vital. Um, so, and we with our travel counsellors have always said and been very, very proactive to see that travel insurance is offered to clients. And if they do refuse that we ask them to get an email from that client saying that they declined travel insurance and that we're making their own um, arrangements mm -hmm. for insurance. Mm -hmm. um, the policy pre um, any cancellations pre 5 March, there was no policy that would cover, but we deal with AIG, which is a preferred partner of Donata. And when the government mandated on the 5th of March, their policy that they didn't want to see, or they advised all residents and 
citizens not to travel, then that actually allowed travel insurance policies to kick in. And I personally have been able to make a claim because this was my year for lots of travel, wasn't it, Ashok? Um, doing a princess cruise and going to Salala and going to India and going to the UK for a wedding, which has all been um, put on hold. And myself and a number of our travel counsellors clients have been able to claim through AIG once we presented a letter saying that we were unable to travel, that we were not able to get a refund, then the insurance claim was paid. So a resounding yes from me for travel insurance for every, each and every person. Great, thank you, Maggie. Ashok, how does it work in the cruising world? Well, as Adnan said, there are various uh, insurances available for travel. Uh, the question is, with a situation like uh, what we are in today, will that cover or no? That's the major one. Plus the destination, some of them, they do have requirement, for example, Schengen. In case you have to apply for a Schengen visa, you have to have an, an, a basic insurance cover. Uh, from the cruise perspective, uh, all the cruise lines, they do offer insurance cover. Mm -hmm. And the one which stands out uh, out of the most is the Princess Cruises. They have something called cancellation fee waiver. Now, with that 10% of the basic cruise cost, it, it gives you a basic cover, which is not an insurance, it's a cancellation fee waiver. If you want to cancel your cruise, regardless of reasons no question asked simply say i don't want to travel and you get your full 100 percent money back and that will cover situation like what we are in today as well so you said that some cruise lines are already giving 125 and 150 percent back did people Precisely. invested in insurance get a bit more than that or how does it work uh no with the insurance it's the normal insurance we are talking about now situation what we are is, is quite exceptional and each cruise line they want to uh, keep their customers with them and that's the reason they are giving away uh, more than 100% of the value they have paid. But we're talking about the insurance uh, product per se. Uh, that's the, uh, not an insurance, but it's a cancellation fee waiver program, which lets you cancel your holidays uh, without any reason asked. Right, okay, okay. I think I get it, I think. I'm not sure, but I think. Um, Emily, uh, can you please tell us about this? Yeah, what are we talking about? Sure. Um, uh, I'm also a resounding yes, agree with Maggie on this as well. I think the thing with insurance and any type of insurance, whether it's house, car, you know, contents or travel insurance, it's always an amount of money that you want to spend and never actually have to get any value for because no one ever wants, obviously, um, to take an insurance policy and have to actually use it. Um, but I just think after, you know, all of my years in the travel industry, the amount of um, heartbreak that I have seen that could have been avoided by people having a good insurance policy, whether it's for um, cancellation and amendment before departure um, because something has happened and they can't travel or if it's to do with a situation whilst they've been on holiday, you know, to, they've had, um, you know, an accident or needed medical, etc. cetera. Um, to me, I think it's just a huge, um, you know, plus. And there are some really affordable policies out there now as well. And um, I mean, my husband and I always get a, um, an annual insurance policy, which means that it covers you for every trip that you do in a year. And that's, I mean, really worth worthwhile as well, makes it really affordable. Um, I think in this situation, um, obviously it's a bit of an interesting one because um, as Maggie said, there was by a certain date and because this was declared a pandemic, um, it means that a lot of the rules that normally apply to insurance needed to change based on that circumstance. But um, I think if you have a read of um, any of the um, studies that they do on insurance in the region, uh, they always say, for example, that with house and contents insurance, after there's been um, you know, big rains here or if there's been a, a fire, they see an upswing for about 24, 48 hours of people purchasing insurance policies and then it just goes back to normal, um, normal purchasing habits again. So I'm wondering because this has gone for such an extended period of time if people are going to um, have a, a greater awareness around it and I think um, as travel agencies we have a duty of care to our customers. I think a lot of people possibly don't um, know what an insurance policy covers or may not understand that it can um, cover you for, you know, before you've even traveled to cover that cancellation and amendment costs. 
um, as well as for when you actually are on your trip. So I think, um, you know, it's our duty to be able to offer that to a customer and explain to them what the benefits is and then for them to make that risk assessment if they choose to travel without it. At least we've done everything we can to try and help assist. So, yeah, I really, I'm very pro travel insurance. <laughs> Yes, no, sure. So Emily, uh, Maggie, and I think Balaji have confirmed that they think uh, travel insurance should be made mandatory in the Middle East. Uh, uh, and Adnan and Ashok say that it should not be made a mandatory. People should be given the choice. No, so, sorry. Uh, am I on the right track for you? I mean, Adnan and Ashok, am I right about what you're thinking? People should be given a choice. Uh, I don't, I don't think you can ever make something completely mandatory. I think people will still need a choice, but I think it should be mandatory that we offer the service. Yep. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, cruise, cruise line do give option to the customer to buy the insurance, but at the end of the day, as Adnan said very quite uh, nicely, it's up to the customer. Uh, they are planning uh, to go on a vacation, which definitely they're not going to cancel it. And situation like uh, the exceptional situation like this, it will never planned or never thought of that it will come and then they have to cancel it. Uh, but from uh, the perspective of people traveling, I think they need to have that peace of mind uh, that in case something like this happens, uh, their interests are covered or their money which they are planning is discovered. No, so great. Right, sorry. I'm, uh, I'm for travel insurance. I've always been a big advocate of it. And uh, like everyone else is saying, it should always be offered to the customers. And we as a company make sure that with every booking being made. Uh, you don't want it to be mandatory, like for the greater good. So not, yeah, nothing. I, I, definitely, I definitely agree with it. I know the value of it. I, I, like uh, most people, I make sure to get travel insurance sorted whenever I'm uh, making a trip anywhere. Um, but again, I just think that given like the understanding of people and their psychologies, I don't think uh, it's been marketed as being an essential sort of component to any trip and i think it might be a bit too late to just expect people to start and make it mandatory now i think some awareness needs to be built on the world first before it starts being made mandatory because if you're just going to expect people to alter their perceptions uh overnight i don't think that's going to happen i think there's going to be backlash and unfortunately it's agents that are going to face the brunt of that backlash initially and not anybody else can I ask you like, a quick question on top of that? Um, this could be a good uh, revenue stream for the travel agents and couldn't this? Absolutely. Yeah, so what do you want to say about that? Um, revenue, reven I mean, obviously any business needs to make revenue, but I think consumer satisfaction is the most paramount factor because that essentially guarantees you future revenue. If people are happy dealing with you and they're happy with the experience you give them you more or less know that they're going to come back to you one way or another. So uh, if, um, if an agent just thinks that I can make a few extra dollars selling this insurance package to this customer and forcing him to take it and making him take it, it's a very high chance that the customer might not come back to you because they look for an alternative, especially if there's one particular package you're going to push onto them without looking at the alternatives. Well, I was thinking more in terms of whether if the government makes it mandatory, but yeah, let's just drop insurance now because there's so much to cover and time's just flying. But thank you, Adnan, for that. Um, Mr. Balaji, I'm just going to put learning and motivation together. Our next topic is what are you doing to motivate your staff and what's the strategy there since you're the chief strategy officer? Yeah. Do we matter? Uh, see, uh, the, it's very, very important uh, for uh, travel industry to get prepared for the future travel, which is unknown. Uh, see, 60% of the travel will remain as it is because the culture of travel uh, will be there. And travel is experiential, okay? Travel is not material. So experiential is always have a better, this, okay, you cannot bring the Maldives or you cannot bring the Swiss Alps into the virtual, uh, this one. So people have to experience it. So everybody has to learn right from top to bottom and that we have been doing from day one and through Travel Academy that we have in TBO. We have been conducted regular, like we have around 120 courses uh, on TBO uh, Travel Academy and we have been training our staff almost every week. We have two or three trainings on 
like you know the uh, new skills new product skills upskilling reskilling uh, and uh, we are also doing lot of things on motivation and where particularly the mind and body has to be really strong to face the situation of the future so we have been doing lot of well being sessions also and uh, we have almost uh, uh, 120 courses and 10000 agents have attended and 29000 certificates have been issued so far and we have conducted so far 60 webinars and uh, i myself has taken uh, two courses uh, on uh, uh, motivational courses i have taken i have taken well being courses i have taken uh, something like safeguarding of the mind i have taken i have taken uh, you be the change i have taken i have taken explore and excel and we are doing art of with art of living we are doing uh, um, uh, conducting courses uh, for mind body and meditation and yoga we are teaching and next week the travel agency sessions are going to start for that also mm-hmm. in the uh, i have been following up for the past 20 years and i want everybody in the travel industry to safeguard themselves and prepare for the future and anything you need regarding that i'm more than welcome to contact me and we have a you know a solution for you Great, thank you, Mr. Balaji. Now we know, we all know where to head to if we are feeling a bit blue. Um, Mr. Gilipal Adnan, what are um, what is Dada Bhai Travel doing at the moment? And uh, you're muted. I can't. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Is it better now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're mainly just focusing on refining the core skills that our people have. we are um making sure that they got in their fundamentals and their basics right we're also helping them develop their personal skills a lot more such as their communication skills their customer service their language skills uh b- basic things really but just to keep them occupied and busy in terms of learning and we're encouraging people to do more research and get in and you know sort of uh continue to improve their bases and things that they are interested in because we never know how that could help us as an organization going forward uh in terms of motivation i think the biggest thing right now is just let people know that their jobs are safe and that their futures are secure and that their safety net is still in place so as as, as long as we can keep reassuring them of that i i don't think there's a better motivational factor in these times in particular so that's essentially what we're doing Yes. and if they need yoga they can just contact yeah of course i might uh, i i just might to be honest but uh, yeah. sorry i couldn't uh, resist that joke i should just yeah sorry um maggie sorry maggie so learning and motivation what is travel i read a lot about travel counselors also doing things Um, yes we've just finished a um a whole um two week training se- session for all of our TCs globally so we have done a lot to work through posit- the positivity and the mindset of the TCs we've had TC interviews interview with external people all about that we are sort of in the mid- this is not the end of the book this is the middle of the book and we've yet to write the last chapter so it's very very positive um we've reached out to all of our key dmcs and all of our suppliers asking them to do webinars and training sessions and product sessions for our travel counselors as well so we're very very cognizant of the fact that we have a lot of our tcs uh doing home schooling at the moment which is also challenging for them so we're just working and you know and those challenges with home schooling also obviously add stress to the individual so we are making sure that we um have a balance that we don't flood them with too much information that they feel a little bit overwhelmed that they've got the opportunity to have some downtime so you know some of our TCs are doing what's called rate my plate and sharing food ideas and being quite critical of some of my cooking i have to say which isn't very nice um but you know we're sort of making sure that we are having some fun we i personally with uh, my team i have daily calls globally we have um calls every 2 days we're sending out a daily uh, update to our travel counselors here in the UAE ditto the same in every other market we're keeping our TCTV going which is always motivational which is where we um, stream live from uh, the office here we've got a television studio in the office um we're doing quiz days we've got a quiz day with the TCs next week um 
the prize is only a box of chocolates or um, something similar, but um, hey ho, we, it's all about costs at the moment. And we're having, we've had virtual coffee mornings. My teams are continuing to reach out to all the TCs by BD calls and also uh, making sure that we're checking in on their health, wealth and wellbeing and, and they're okay. Great. Now that's, that's great to know, Maggie. Thank you. Ashok, how is it going on the cruise front? Do people um, want to be trained at the moment? Do they want to be left alone? Are they getting too much training? How is it? How, what's happening on the cruise side of things? At the moment, uh, I will say, as Adnan said uh, very nicely, uh, is the best motivation that we can give the travel industry colleagues is empathize with them, with the situation they are in at the moment. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we don't know uh, a situation will be now clearer after the Ramadan is over and uh, the office starts opening up. Um, today, Dubai has opened up with uh, 50% of uh, the manpower that uh, agencies can open up. And I reckon there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, negative feeling in the industry whereby people may be uh, losing the job. So best motivation at the moment. Uh, we can give them is uh, uh, to make sure that they have their jobs, uh, they have continuity in the jobs, and as Balaji said very nicely, uh, to give them occupied emotionally, and uh, yoga is the best uh, to keep them uh, occupied. Perfect. Thank you, Ashok. Emily, what's uh, Denata Travel doing? What What's your... <clears throat> Sure. Um, I think, I mean, some of it is very similar in terms of training and development and keeping in touch. I think uh, when it comes to motivation um, of staff, I think the number one thing that we can do um, is just make sure that we're communicating really consistent, uh, consistently, regularly, um, and keeping people up to date with as much as possible about what's happening in the business, um, you know, and, and what the future looks like. So, um, you know, we're having daily and weekly calls with the teams and, and going over, you know, the different forecasts for the future and, and the different projects that we're working on. Um, I think, you know, it's a tough one in some ways because you want it. You also need to make sure that I think, um, you know, understanding that you are checking in on your team and, and finding out how they are and spending that time really listening to where they're up to um, is often the most important thing. And I think we just need to be really careful that we don't try and put on too many um, things that might end up just looking like we're trying to entertain people rather than actually helping, you know, to give people enough of a rest and a break um, from what is a really stressful situation as well as, you know, offering an opportunity for them to do as much um, learning or um, keep themselves entertained. And I think, uh, like Maggie said before, you know, people are juggling a lot of things in their home life as well. So um, we, one thing I'm really hoping that we'll carry forward from this is that we've been doing um, have some really successful and wonderful webinars and training sessions with external partners, hotels, suppliers, airlines. Um, and it just will be, it seems silly for us to not carry that into the future, considering that all of our team, you know, sit out across multiple sites and retail outlets across, you know, head office, different countries, etc. cetera, um, that, you know, we may as well keep this going. There's no reason for us to stop doing it and trying to insist on bringing people together to do training. Um, you know, when some of it can be done really well via video call. So I think it'll be interesting to see in the future how we manage to balance it. Sure. So, yeah. Um, we move on to um, what do you think uh, is the future for Uber Lux itineraries? You know, really luxurious, absolutely high end private jet travel. What's the future? We'll just go to one line now because I'm kind of overshooting our deadline. So please just shorten yeah, definitely, uh, uh, definitely, because uh, the distance and, you know, the privacy, safety, health, and so many things are there. So people who could afford definitely would like to pay an extra price uh, to avail. As such, you have a VIP and luxury customer, and they will definitely would like to avail the benefits if there is anything like that. And definitely luxury market uh, will be there, and it will have a different pattern and flavor now in the future based on what is a, a required. So people pay extra money for that. So definitely there will be a, a value for that, definitely. Now, will there be a spike? Do you think there will be a spike in luxury itineraries? Um, Personally, no. I think the people that are used to traveling with those type of itineraries are going to continue to. And I don't think 
think um, a lot of people will immediately make the shift towards that because they will be worried about essentially being able to continue living that once you do it once it's very hard to go back to a non-luxury itinerary so mm -hmm. yeah I, I think like I said I think the people that are used to it or have been doing it to no. all their will, will continue to and um, I hope more people start but I personally don't see it happening practically happening okay uh, Maggie what what's the feelers from your what what do you think is going to happen are Uber Lux itinerary suddenly going to pick up I think it's going to be a mix again based on the um, affordability or the ability for those people who have actually had salary reductions during this time and a lot of our expat partners have had salary reductions as well as lost uh, funds but for those who can afford it yes certainly I think it will take um, certainly continue I believe because of the impact that this has had on the world that we will see a spike in people who want to travel responsibly and sustainably and less, leave less of a footprint on the planet because the, the, the ability to travel has been withheld and so the desire to travel is increased and the impact that travel has on the environment has become very, very prevalent. So that's where we see um, a lot of opportunity. And we also, as a company, do a lot of work with uh, suppliers that do offer sustainable and responsible tourism. Um, and business travel, we think, will come back, but it's only if an employer can make sure that their um, staff are safe. No one's going to take the risk of sending staff away somewhere to a destination for business unless they can ensure that they, their health, wealth and safety is um, at 100%. Thank you, Maggie. Ashok, Uber luxury itineraries. Unmute yourself. I can talk from the cruising perspective because uh, as we speak, situation is still evolving and it will a lot will depend on uh, how different countries open up uh, their borders to international travels. But I see uh, there's going to be a uh, demand. The desire for travel will always be there. And people who can afford it will definitely be looking at uh, smaller ships, which means uh, the luxury ones, or which could also mean people, instead of going for the uh, uh, ocean where uh, they might uh, look at traveling on the river cruising. So uh, people will definitely be traveling once they, the borders are opened up. And uh, again, uh, Yes, there will be a little uh, uh, demand for the smaller ships also. Great. Thank you. Before I go to Emily, we've obviously, um, we, we may overshoot by 15 minutes. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, great. Thank you so much. Not more than 15, I promise you. Uh, sure. Emily, I was just going to say I have to do a hard stop at quarter past but that's fine I can leave till then um, I think I just uh, building on what everyone else was saying about luxury travel I think um, moving into the future there's going to probably uh, be um, a bit of a, an interesting um, uh, decision making process for people where they're going to choose between uh, what they see is maybe spending more money for uh, more luxuries that will I think will impact how they feel about the risk and the safety piece so obviously um, you know, if someone wants to, uh, I know there's a lot of talk about whether or not they'll be removing travel on the middle seat or, you know, maybe people wanting to fly in business class because it feels less crowded. Um, and I think one of the trends that we've just seen in the last few weeks with staycations particularly is that uh, customers have been looking for um, a hotel or a staycation option where they have a, a villa with a private pool, which um, you know comes at a much higher price than if you're happy just to have a hotel room. So I think we've seen that swing happen and the, the main piece of feedback for that is people feeling a lot safer um, you know, staying, having a staycation with their own pool rather than being in a, in a space with a lot of other people. And I think you'll see that when it comes to things like people avoiding public transport and wanting to take private transfers, you know, as I said, um, a business or first class seat because it feels less crowded, um, you know, and people wanting to lower their risk by possibly spending more money. Um, but then I think that will all be offset by the fact that a lot of people just won't be able to necessarily afford it. And I think we'll see possibly see a lot of people traveling home to see loved ones this year and maybe opting to have um, their holiday in their own country 
um, as opposed to going somewhere else because of that feeling of safety and understanding what's happening. So, yeah. Great. Um, Mr. Balaji, um, I'm sorry, I'm muting you. Um, so TBO Holidays recently opened a different, um, you opened TBO Cruise, didn't you? So yeah, TBO Cruise we have launched actually and uh, now the integrations are happening. So um, as Ashok says, uh, the, the cruise might take some time to pick up. As such, the Middle East and Africa region is uh, very small compared to the portion of the bigger picture. At the same time, uh, yes, uh, people will, uh, um, you know, the prefer the river cruise, uh, yachts and leasing and those areas will pick up. So we are uh, also looking in those directions so that there will be a market for that. And um, I think cruise is one such product that we are uh, definitely, it's coming soon. Great. Um, Adnan, could I ask you to... Uh share what you feel is the future of cruising, the immediate or mid to long-term future of cruising for us, for the region? I think the, gen the initial recovery is going to be slow, particularly because of the fears people might have with taking a cruise given the circumstances and situation. But I also do know that there are some people that only travel by cruise and only take holidays on cruises. And I don't think that's going to stop. Uh, I, I think like all uh, the verticals in the industry, it will in the long term increase and go up. But I just think the recovery is going to be slower than people taking more conventional holidays or more, um, you know, more alternative holidays than cruising. Okay, so was that me? That's Maggie, sorry. Yes, okay. Um, well, I, I love cruising, as Ashok knows, and I've booked on a Princess Cruise to do the Baltic next month, which sadly I won't be on. But um, I believe that the sector will be uh, take a lot longer to bounce back. But for those people who are cruise enthusiasts, yes, they will. And I also believe the cruise companies are making adaptations as we speak now to make sure that their customers are safe and sound and um, we don't have a situation that we've had which sadly the cruise industry took the brunt of in a lot of cases and got a lot of negative press i think um, we will see that it will take longer but it will bounce back great thank you for the positive message there um ashok Certainly it's going to bounce back, but a lot will depend at the moment on, first of all, the aviation to open up, then the land borders to open up, and then uh, it's going to be uh, the cruising, which is, uh, they are ready. Uh, they are ready much more than uh, any other land-based location, uh, because from the health perspective, they uh, already have uh, infrastructure in place on board the ship. In terms of sanitization program, each cruise lines they are working on even as they call it uh, deeper clean sanitization programs. And that's definitely going to give much more confidence to the travelers. But again, it depends first on the aviation and then uh, on the uh, borders to open up before they, they jump in and then start operating the cruises. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Um, Emily, would you like to... Um comment on cruises. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the cruise environment anyway has all uh, like already in the past meant that they've had to have a high level of, um, you know, sanitation and, um, and safety on board ship anyway, because of the fact it's an enclosed environment with a lot of people on it. So um, I think, as Adnan said earlier, there are people that love, there are cruisers, people that love cruising. So I think they will continue to do so into the future. And I think with any type of travel, um, what's going to be the most important is just um, information and being able to be, be able to provide customers with um, the knowledge and security about what's going on. And I think that's, uh, that's going to be a really interesting thing for the travel industry to manage because, you know, even with things to do with borders reopening and understanding, you know, how long someone needs to quarantine for, if they need to be tested before they go and all of that kind of um, information is, is going to be how we can um, consolidate it all, validate it's correct, and then be able to pass it on to our customers 
um, in a way that is easy for them to understand and to give and it gives them that security that um, you know they know what they're getting in for when they're off on a trip. So I think I think the uncertainty is the part at the moment that will play against us. Where especially if people think it's a risk to leave if they can't come back again, or you know, will will they have to take two weeks at either end to quarantine? Um, you know, and whether or not people's employers uh, will be up for that, um, allowing people to work from home after they've come back from a trip. I think um, I think all of those things are, are what are going to play into it at the end of the day. So. I'm down to my last question. Uh, uh, Mr. Balaji, what do you think uh, will happen this summer? Will there be a lot of travel? Will there be some travel? Will, be, will there be no travel? Because airlines are opening up slowly, aren't they? See, the airlines are opening up. Uh, so immediate travel would be domestic, regional, and short haul travel is something which will start immediately. Because people have to be comfortable uh, and the government has to be comfortable, the airline has to be comfortable. Everybody has to, everybody has to go through, gone through the change and uh, they, nobody knows how it's going to be the, the sun. So it will start. Maybe the uh, leisure travel, FIT, uh, those things will pick up. Uh, corporate travel might take a little longer time, uh, this one, because there will be liquidity required in the market. So liquidity is something that uh, we need to look into it. Uh, so family joining and uh, expats going back to the country uh, and uh, they, please, uh, people are comfortable with destinations and locations where they can be safe. That is what they will be traveling. So like Indian Ocean Islands, uh, the exclusive resorts, mountain resorts, beach resort and yeah. things that people will be looking for safety and hygiene is uh, this one. Then uh, after that, uh, maybe we'll see Then things will move, uh, take a second shape, but it might take a year for it to come back like maybe 2019, maybe around 18 months it might take. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Adnan, what do you think is happening this summer? I think the people that need to travel will, and I think the people that uh, are dying to travel because of being locked in their homes for the past three months will just, you know, bite the bullet, take the risk and get on the first flight they can do a little bit of research, maybe not extensive research. Um, it, it, it's hard to say because different conversations you have with people uh, give you a different insights. There are some people who don't care. They just want to get on a flight and go somewhere. And then there are other people who say that they're not going to be flying for the next year, if, even if a vaccine does come out for some reason. It's just, it's just hard to gauge really, but I, I think um, we're definitely going to see some activity because uh, so many things are dependent on travel happening from the corporate perspective, from the personal perspective. Uh, people want to see their families. People want right. to get work done. People need to get work done. And sometimes the only way to get that done is travel. It's more than just, um, you know, a, a luxury or, or, a, or something, uh, you know, nice to do for yourself. It's a necessity. And uh, I'm just going to... Um, Maggie? Well, there's already been an interesting survey done by all details of GCC travellers in the region, and 72% of those respondents said that they're ready to travel when restrictions are lifted, but they all said their health and security was going to be a priority. Uh, the majority said they're looking for change for nature and sea and culture, and 80% of the travellers said they would like to travel for one week or more. Um, there's a variation between change of scenery and unique, unique landscape, landscapes, sea, city and culture, but it all depends upon, again, the, with the, the way the corridors open. Um, you know, Mauritius is now free. They're, they're talking about a corridor between Australia and New Zealand. Um, you know, for us in the Indian Ocean, uh, the corridor between here and the Seychelles and, say, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the Maldives, uh, would be a really good opportunity for us as well as um, the increase in properties now available in the region for staycations like Abu Dhabi's just opened up, more hotels have opened up in Dubai. So there are, yeah, my, my personal feeling is that a lot of people stay put this summer because of the restriction with say, especially the UK and Australia having to have that two week um, forced quarantine but for Christmas I think we'll see 
a lot of the expats heading home to make sure that they have a real family Christmas this year and reconnect with those people that they've only been able to do over Zoom calls anyway. But the responsibility of us all as an industry and especially travel councillors as a company is that duty of care and making sure that we have got the facts right so we can then guide our clients um, along the right path to make sure that they're making informed decisions based on the knowledge that we have gained and that we have actually made sure that we are up to date and validated before we make these sort of opportunities available to them. Perfect. Thank you, Maggie. Um, uh, Emily, would you like to answer first? I'm just breaking the chain here because I think you need to leave in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, sure. What just, uh, just about summer. Um, I mean, I think we've got very similar um, ideas as, as everybody else. It will be, everything will depend on how quickly um, and what opens up to us. Uh, we had thought after the staycation market opening that maybe the next thing would be um, cross-border um, you know, maybe road trips, people going to Oman, to Saudi, if, if those borders open up quickly. Um, but yeah, I think people will be looking for um, places that's, you know, fresh air, outdoors, you know, Indian Ocean, Switzerland, you know, getting to the mountains. I think that will be very popular. But I think overall, um, I very much agree with Maggie. I think people um, will be, you know, wanting to get home at some point in the next six months and possibly then doing um, travel within their home country. Uh, I'm from New Zealand, and I have to say that I did actually say to my husband <laughs> earlier um, that maybe we could go on holiday to New Zealand this year because uh, obviously it's a uh, currently a very um, uh, like great looking spot to go to considering how well they've done. Um, but I think I think we're just going to have to wait and see. And I think it's really important at the moment that we are you know doing as much listening as possible when it comes to finding out what our customers are wanting to do um, and see how we can make that happen and just make sure we supply as much. Uh, information as possible um, to be able to to be able to help that you know to happen so I think we you know we'll wait and see I guess the thing is that even you know right now it feels like the only thing that's been happening has been this whole COVID situation but in the background life has just been carrying on right and there are a lot of people that will need to get home for you know may have um, uh, you know lost someone in their family may have medical reasons they need to travel for there's a lot of other reasons why people will need to, will need to travel um, that we I guess we just don't talk about very much that I think we will see um, a, you know an immediate spike and then maybe that might um, you know tail off a bit and people might do a lot more domestic travel in the meantime but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Yes. Great, thanks. Questions? Sorry, or would you be leaving us now? Yeah, I'm really sorry. I have to go. Thank okay. you so much, everyone. For everything. It's lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, Ashok, sorry. Ashok, what's the feel? What's what's happening over the summer for? Cruises. I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to let you answer. <laughs> uh, summer cruises, I think the uh, domestic uh, cruising within USA will be opening up uh, sooner than later. Uh, internationally, uh, I would say the Norwegian coastal voyages may open up. As I said earlier, again, it depends a lot on uh, the opening of the border and on the aviation side of it. Uh, but international cruises worldwide, I think it will take uh, maybe October or November, or I would say quarter fourth of, of this year when the cruises worldwide open up. But uh, again, uh, since it is evolving, it may change. Uh, but my rough estimation are by October, the cruises should be operational internationally as well. Are there new cruise lines um, going to come to the Middle East? Because I heard the, that there is a possibility that new vessels may be docked here in the like in the near future because they're considering this safer than the, you know our region safer than say the u.s at the moment uh certainly it is safer uh what's happening right now there are at least uh four five brands which uh, use dubai as uh, winter cruises and the other cruise lines they use dubai as a turnaround or as a part of their repositioning cruises and I believe uh, 2021 P&O cruises out of UK, they are again looking at coming back to the Gulf and uh, do uh, seven and eight nights uh, round trip Dubai cruises. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, great. So that's it from me. I think Kim has questions and she has questions from the audience as well. So yeah, we have just one question from the audience here. I hope I can um, actually understand it. Um, it's uh, from Muhammad Khalid. He hasn't really said where he's from. Um, big uh, tour operators like TUI and Donata has huge amounts to pay hotels and yet pushing hotels to extend credit, credit even further. Um, I don't get his second partner. How do you think it will impact hotels and resorts, especially destinations like the Maldives? And that's to any of the panelists. Who would like to answer that? Would any of you know? <laughs> anything this, anything this, on the cruises I can help. Ah, okay, this let, 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 let Adnan go first and then you help us shoot. Uh, I think, um... I'm not too sure about what he means either, but because um, I think everybody is just being asked to extend credit right now, not just the hotels. So yeah. I think going, it's just ending up uh, in one big cycle of credit being extended and deferred and payments not coming through, which eventually does come to a standstill somewhere once the uh, core costs need to be met. Um, so. I know that hotels are really suffering right now. We have a few in our group of companies and in our portfolio. And uh, right now, the only, essentially only business they have is being used as quarantine centers for people, which I think is the case with the majority of the hotels around the world right now. Um, in terms of extending credit, I don't think it benefits anybody. And I think they will end up taking massive hits to their bottom line because of it. Yes, Thanks. credit is something uh, is a question for some more time because insurance companies have already are under very tight squeeze and it's a chain reaction. Liquidity is going to take some time and a lot of evaluation is required at all stages. No open credit will be there. There will be secured credit will be given and reciprocal credit can be uh, will be given. But there will be a lot of evaluation on credit policies and procedures uh, by many. And that we need to accept it because that is a reality. Like nobody want to uh, throw the money out and uh, struggling hard to collect the money. So it is a chain reaction and uh, it might take some time to come into a normal scene, definitely. Great. Okay. Well, cash flow is king at the moment. Um, obviously, everyone is working hard to retain their cash. Um, and with refunds going through the businesses as well, you know, we need to make sure that every company survives. Um, for travel counsellors, we've actually got um, a trust set up. And also because the company is based in the UK, they've got Atoll and accreditation. So we as a company are very, very conscious that we need to be paid and our suppliers need to be paid um, because otherwise we end up with bottlenecks. So we need to sort of keep it going, um, but being mindful that um, cash is king until we come through this in a few months' time. And cruising a show? Cruising, I would say, since the cash is held by the cruise lines and uh, the, the, all the accounting is maintained with, with them. And as and when the situation and when the, uh, they have been taking the pass, they have been very prompt to uh, refund the money back to us. And we in turn have been refunding back to the client and the travel partners. Okay, great. There was another question from Hussein. Hussein, and again, he hasn't said where he's from. Um, he wants to know how he can contact sub agents now that you can't do face-to-face -face meetings? See, uh, sub-agents can be, see, every salesperson has got the deal. Like you cannot physically visit many of them now, but you can still be in contact with many. Everybody knows the uh, right yeah. managers and things like that, and they can still contact them over phone. And only when it is required, there is a personal uh, involvement required. Otherwise, still it can be contacted, and we are doing it the past uh, three months and it can still be done. Yes. You need to Great. accept the current reality. You cannot be there. You cannot be there, but uh, <laughs> you can still touch the heart over the phone or uh, by so many uh, options that are available now. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. Just a question for me, because I know y'all have been on here quite a while. Um, you talked about the people you had and said that you're willing to, you're refunding when people want refunding, but as a whole, are people happy to keep, uh, money with you for the future or has it been more um, I'd rather have my money back now because I guess everybody's it's tough times with salary cuts and job losses and things 
Yeah, I would say the vast majority of people would prefer having more disposable income in their pockets uh, to lose on what they need to survive, essentially. No one knows what's going to yeah. happen. Uh, people who are more financially secure can be understanding, but that's honestly a rarity where we see somebody say, no, it's fine, you can keep our money with you until we need yeah. it. You know? Yeah, so, no, that's fair enough. <laughs> We've had the same situation, Kim, that we've, um, we've given them the three options to kick the booking forward. So do it at the end of summer or into next year. And a lot, there's obviously a lot of flexibility to do that. The second is to offer credit um, and we hold the funds. And then the third is obviously to offer a refund when we've got that refund from the supplier. But so um, you know, choice. But we give the choice. It's always important. Choice is important. Absolutely. And Ashok, I think cruises are doing the same. They're giving choice. Yes. A little bit each more credit. Line, you'll take the each, voucher. No, each cruise line has a different policy. Some of them are yeah. giving uh, future cruise credit up to the value of 125% of what they have paid. Some of them are giving us a straightway 100% refund, and others are giving uh, future cruise credit plus uh, adding up uh, uh, $100 or $200 extra in case they want to keep yeah. it for. Uh, uh, the next year and a half so those are good till uh, december 2021 great just one quick last one you talked about there has been surveys about what people are going to do as soon as borders are opening up and you mentioned that and that Istanbul said that they're opening already and i just got an email that spain is opening border and are not going to quarantine you for two weeks um do you do you have people you, you mentioned that that domestic travel has already happened particularly with the e you've had staycations or what have you um, do you think people will go to Istanbul and Spain and places that are opening their borders? I know you've indicated that it's going to be slow, but absolutely, client, yeah. Absolutely. The young ones uh, definitely would like to take a chance, and uh, because you can't avoid, you know, people will take precautions and travel. But of course, they might not travel to congested places. They may not travel uh, this one, but they will still travel. Uh, but it depends upon the, the demography is also this one. Like young ones with immunity might uh, be the first one. The solo travels will be the first one to test their this one skills outside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the rest of them will take uh, precautions, see them and travel. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Super. I think you've pretty much all of you had answered that earlier anyway. But um, I was just curious with, with more trying to open their borders anyway. But... I think I it's mean, for me, that's sadly a little bit over that age that the UAE thinks to be old. <laughs> no way they'll let me on an airplane. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're only as old as you feel, really. So. Well, I, Absolutely. I, as Rashi said, I run a half marathon. Some 40-year-olds don't do that. But they, that doesn't that say amazing. that on my ID card. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Rashi, you want to come back in and say... Oh, it's just a bit hair situation. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you're you very welcome, much. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Great, thank we you. actually had a yeah. comment from one of our viewers that says, great panels. They really enjoyed the session. So thank you very much. Stay, stay so safe. Viewer, though. <laughs> stay yeah. safe, 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 healthy. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Just decided to put it in writing. <laughs> right. Thanks, everybody, yeah. from TC right. Ted thank and you. Travel Counselors. Appreciate it. Very nice. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. You. You save the best for last. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Love our TC Ted. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Okay. So, how was it, Ashok? What do you think? We still have it went, I think it went well. It went well. Participants listening. So, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll call you. <laughs> okay. Bye, participants. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, all.